morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the webinar, Immunosenescence, a Proxy for High-Risk Populations in Immunization Policy. My name is Supriya Venegala, Program Manager with the IFA. As the first of a three-part policy dialogue series called Driving Adult Vaccination Policy, that is built around issues for which immunization policy or action will improve and save the lives of potentially millions of older people, this webinar focuses on improving the understanding of the increased risk of disease associated with immunosenescence. Immunosenescence, which is the age-related weakening of various protective immune responses, places older people at an increased risk of vaccine preventable diseases and must be recognized as a high risk category in vaccine policy in order to inform a more comprehensive public health strategy. There is a lack of policy recognition of adult vaccination in the WHO immunization agenda 2030 and the UN decade of healthy aging and the impact of ageism as evidenced through the WHO Global Report on Ageism. This series of policy dialogues is proposed to make clear the public health connections between the immunization agenda, the decade, and the campaign to combat ageism featuring issues and opportunities for improving adult vaccination coverage. Today's webinar features key experts, Dr. Melissa Andrew, Dr. Antonio Torres, and Dr. Martin Fried, and will be moderated by Dr. John Beard, whose vast experience speaks for itself. Dr. Beard works globally with academia, policymakers, and the private sector to reimagine the second half of life. He is a professor with the University of New South Wales, commissioner with the U US National Academy of Medicine Commission on Healthy Longevity, and a visiting professor at Toulouse and Peking Universities. From 2005 to 2019, he was the director of Aging and Life Course with the World Health Organization in Geneva, where he led major global initiatives, including the World Report on Aging and Health and the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities, and has worked extensively with the World Economic Forum, including as chair of their Global Agenda Council on Population Aging. It is now my honor to hand the floor over to Dr. John Beard. Thank you very much, Supriya, and uh, greetings, everybody. It's great to be with you uh, for this uh, webinar on immunosenescence, a proxy for high-risk populations in immunization policy. Now, don't be put off by the title. It sounds like we're going to get into a real detail, and, and uh, some people may be a bit daunted by that. I promise you we're going to keep it. Uh, we're going to be able to translate the technical detail that's really important in, on this topic into policy reality for, for everybody. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank the uh, IFA for putting in place this series of, this, of three webinars. Um, and also uh, through the uh, recent global uh, uh, conference on aging, um, where in fact, there were a couple of sessions on vaccination and they were, I think they were very well uh, received and we ended up having some very interesting discussions and I hope to be able to continue that forward today. Uh, to do that, we have three terrific speakers. I'll introduce uh, each of them uh, before they speak, uh, but we have Dr. Antonio Torres from Barcelona. Um, we have uh, Dr. Melissa Andrew from Dalhousie uh, and we have Martin Freed from uh, uh, WHO. Um, now, why are we talking about this topic? Well, I I mean, it should be obvious to everybody as we're going through this terrible pandemic, just how important vaccination is. Uh, and particularly for older people, we saw during the pandemic that older people were at the greatest risk of uh, adverse consequences of COVID infection. Um, but fortunately, we actually also saw vaccinations which were very effective and which have probably saved millions of lives. Um, one of the challenges though, is that as people age, uh, one of the universal characteristics is what is known as immune senescence, which is a decline in the performance of the immune system. Things like your thymus gland gradually shrink after puberty, uh, and you make less uh, of some of the immune cells which uh, drive our immune response. 
this is challenging because it can make you more vulnerable to infection, but it also make, may make us less responsive to the vaccines, which uh, older people might, uh, might benefit from. Um, another area, though, that's probably just as important in, in this field is until recently, most thinking on vaccination has focused very much on the beginning of life, on childhood illnesses, on trying to prevent a childhood illness or a death, uh, without really thinking about the consequences that occur across the life course, and without thinking about the conditions in older age, which may also benefit significantly uh, from vaccination. This is starting to change, but we're going to explore today a little bit about uh, why, the, why vaccination is important in older age, why we need to be thinking a little bit differently about vaccination in older age than perhaps in, in early life, and also why has it not been on the agenda? Because for some of us, it seems very obvious that this should be a priority area of focus. Um, so welcome. Uh, the other thing I, I, I must mention is that there's a companion paper uh, that has been uh, published recently called The Epidemiologic and Biologic Basis for Classifying Older Age as a High-Risk Immunocompromising Condition for Pneumococcal Vaccine Policy. Um, and uh, I'd all urge you all to uh, uh, try to access that if you can. Um, but I'd like to also get on with our, with our presentations and uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Antonio Torres, who is our, our first speaker. Oh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Melissa Andrew, who is our first speaker. Um, Dr. Andrew is a geriatrician and professor of medicine and geriatrics at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, she has a master's degree in public health uh, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a PhD from Dalh Dalhousie um, on the subject of frailty and social vulnerability. And her research very much takes up on that experience and looks at how frailty impacts older adults' responses to vaccines and infectious uh, illnesses. Uh, so you can see how relevant this is going to be for our discussion today. So uh, Dr. Andrew, please, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm honored to be here today and hopefully I can help to uh, contribute to this discussion. So I really want to focus on ideas around who is at high risk and how we can understand that in a somewhat unified way. Um, so part of what I'll be doing is talking about aging and uh, frailty. Uh, so some disclosures, I do have um, uh, funding uh, for various grants that I'll be mentioning some of these today from different agencies and from industry partners. And I've done some consulting and advising work around trying to get frailty on the agenda uh, for these uh, different vaccines. So you might be asking yourself um, what frailty has to do with vaccines and infections, because it's not always obvious even within our own community, people who understand uh, frailty and aging well. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to some of these key points in the next 15 minutes. So I want to talk to you about five things. So, so really, uh, frailty is a way of measuring and understanding vulnerability to outcomes. And on the flip side, you could think about vitality as a way of protecting people from adverse outcomes. And that really comes down to understanding the difference between a biological or personalized health age versus a chronological age. Then the second point will be that the impact of frailty on vaccine performance varies. Um, and there are probably ways to design vaccines to improve older people's responses. Uh, the third thing is that frail older adults are at increased risk uh, for infections and the complications that come from those. Fourth, we'll turn to how really we need to take a long-term view of the impact of infections. So we often think of infections as having um, importance in the short term with morbidity, mortality, hospitalization, but we really need to be thinking long-term, especially with functional outcomes and quality of life for older people. And then the fifth thing is then to tie it all together to say that really vaccine preventable infections um, can contribute to worsening function and quality of life for older people. And we need to turn that story around by improving vaccination for older adults. So turning to point number one, uh, this distinction between uh, biological age and chronological age is really interesting. It's actually something that uh, Dr. Fried will be taking a slightly different lens on in his talk about talking about how immune age is not the same as chronological age. So what, what do we really mean here? So the term frailty is out there in the world. It's been used in many different ways. 
Um, but I think many of our, or all the definitions pretty much agree that it has to do with a state of increased vulnerability uh, to adverse outcomes. So people who are more frail are more vulnerable to bad things happening. And so this figure here um, from the Clegg paper in the Lancet just illustrates this where someone who is not frail on the, on the flip side, you can think of this, somebody who has high vitality um, could, uh, ha has a good level of function, is quite independent uh, at baseline. They get a minor illness uh, and, or a major illness. This could be an influenza or something like that too. They take a dip in their function and their health status, but they're able to recover pretty much back to where they started. Now, someone who is much more vulnerable and closer to that edge of being dependent on others, um, this person would be frail. So they, they're sort of teetering a little bit more on the edge. They take a much bigger hit with the same illness. They take a longer time to recover and they may not get back to where they were before in terms of their functional status. So that is really one way of thinking about the importance of frailty. So there are different ways of measuring frailty. Some measures are very physical and they've been used in some of the studies. I won't be focusing on this one so much um, because it's not quite as um, graded uh, in terms of understanding uh, the full spectrum of frailty. Uh, the clinical frailty scale is another one that's been used, especially now more in the, in the COVID pandemic, where people are, are um, categorized in terms of their, um, their function mostly. Uh, and then the frailty index is a way that we can put together many health deficits from across multiple different um, uh, domains. So function, sensory, um, various um, history of medical conditions, um, cognition, mood, all these things come together to really understand somebody's frailty and vitality in a much more graded and nuanced way. Uh, so uh, that's the one that I'm showing here. So, so to make this point that biological age is not the same as chronological age, we all know, of course, that people who are older have a higher risk of, of mortality. So here's a cohort divided by age, the so people in their 70s, you know, most of them have survived uh, five years, whereas people who are already 100, you know, a very few of them would survive another five years. However, uh, still some of them have, right? So we, we haven't really uh, understood the separation as well as we might. Here using a frailty index where we've gotten quite a detailed uh, view of somebody's um, uh, health and functional status based on a comprehensive geriatric assessment. Here we can see that people who are not frail at any of these older ages tend to survive quite well for five years. Whereas the people who are very frail uh, have um, uh, very high mortality uh, similar to, uh, it's interesting, it's, it's shaped like a radioactive decay curve. It's almost like they're just sitting there waiting for that last random event to happen. So that speaks to some of the math. Uh, in any event, the, the uh, frailty measure here has been widely used across many different settings and it's remarkable how its properties are maintained. So that helps us understand how frailty is one way of understanding biological age. Now, how do we apply that to vaccine effectiveness or vaccine efficacy? So um, we've been working on this in our Serious Outcomes Surveillance Network, which is part of the Canadian Immunization Research Network. Um, we've got these sites uh, across Canada where we've been looking at um, hospitalized um, adults um, across a more than a decade for influenza and now turning to COVID-19 as well. And one of the things that was unique, particularly at the beginning of um, our network, was that we were focusing on frailty and function um, to really um, dig down into the impact of influenza and now COVID. Um, and also we do some work on pneumococcus, as I'll show you a bit later, uh, for frail uh, older adults. So the way that we have looked at vaccine effectiveness in this population is using a test negative case control design. So really this is all patients who have been admitted to hospital. They've all met the same sort of very broad case definitions for an acute respiratory illness. Um, some of them are um, lab confirmed cases of say influenza. Some of them are controls who tested negative. And then you look to see how many of them have been vaccinated in each group. And there's a way of calculating vaccine effectiveness and adjusting for various confounders. So here's an example. So um, when we looked at vaccine effectiveness in this one particular season, um, by age, we would see that if you don't adjust for anything, 
uh, the vaccine effectiveness for older adults in that season appeared to be about 45%, which is pretty good, you know, preventing uh, hospitalization in 45% of cases. When we adjust for all of the relevant confounders, that actually changed quite a bit in that season, particularly um, when we adjusted for frailty. So it went up to about 58%. So it's interesting that adjusting for frailty alone ver was very closely approximating the final fully adjusted model. So, so the message uh, that we found really is that if you want to understand one thing about a older person or any age person, as we'll see, um, understanding their frailty in a very holistic way is um, uh, an important way to understand their risk. And this was using a frailty index, that very comprehensive view of frailty. Another way to look at this is that if we stratify by, these are the fit people who are not frail, these people are pre-frail or sort of not, not frail, but not exactly fit, then we get frail and then most frail. So the vaccine effectiveness did tend to decrease with increasing categories of frailty. But the paradox of course is that the, um, the most vulnerable people are in the most frail groups. And we really need to focus our efforts on improving vaccine coverage and vaccine effectiveness for those groups. Now, and the, the benefits as well is that most older adults are not frail. And so they can have very good responses to vaccines. So we need to target them as well. Here's some work that I uh, did along uh, looking at uh, frailty in a large clinical trial of shingles vaccine. Because one thing that's really interesting about this field is that frailty has been very rarely considered uh, in clinical trials uh, of vaccines. And this was an opportunity to do a secondary analysis of the very large ZOE 50 and ZOE 70 studies where they looked at, it was a randomized trial of this shing recombinant uh, zoster vaccine um, in people over 50 and over 70. So what we did is take the opportunity to do a retrospective analysis, um, generating a frailty index, again, one of these quite comprehensive uh, ways to, uh, um, to generate like the, the whole spectrum of frailty using uh, a frailty index of 41 items in this case that were already collected in the trial. And then uh, for the purposes of reporting and understanding it more clearly, we categorized into non-frail, pre-frail and frail. Uh, what we found, interestingly, was that there was a recruitment of frail and pre-frail individuals into the trial, which is good um, to see because, you know, we do get concerned that often the frailest older people are excluded from trials, which we can certainly talk about in the discussion. So we had some inc inclusion of frail and pre-frail individuals in that trial, particularly at older ages, of course. Um, and the vaccine efficacy was actually quite good even across the three grades of frailty. So that demonstrates that in some cases, vaccine efficacy can be quite good, has to do with the design of the vaccine. Now, the third point um, is to really understand how infections are drivers of complications and poor outcomes. And we will talk about this more as we go, but certainly, you know, we, we see for each of these conditions that there are list, lists of high risk conditions. Uh, so what makes somebody at high risk? Is it that they have poor immune responses? Uh, could it be that they don't, they present atypically and they don't have their illness identified in time to get good treatment? Do they live in places and settings with high attack rates? And uh, are they vulnerable to persistent functional declines and poor outcomes? And so really, I would argue that it's all of these things that make somebody high risk and older age is, is really a, a proxy for capturing many of these things. So this is just uh, a summary of uh, the many complications of influenza, which we know very well can trigger, you know, um, worsening of underlying health conditions, uh, as well as, it turns out, functional declines. We've done some work on <clears throat> pneumococcal illness uh, in our network, as I mentioned, and we see that, uh, generally speaking, vaccination coverage tends to be higher at older ages and with increasing frailty. Mortality is higher at older age and with increasing frailty, but ICU admissions generally decrease. Although interestingly, we found with both dividing it by age and by frailty, the, the ICU admissions for pneumococcal and pneumonia tended to be higher than for non-pneumococcal. Interesting. Uh, when we look at uh, COVID, we see that frailty does not only affect older people, in fact, we can measure frailty in younger people as well and see that there's a range of frailty from not frail at all to uh, very severely frail in both older and younger age groups with COVID-19. And that certainly age and frailty are both big drivers of mortality in COVID. Um, but we do see that uh, 
paradox about how they have lower intensive care use, which is likely about goals of care discussions. So why is it that um, uh, older people and particularly residents in nursing homes have been so vulnerable to COVID-19? You know, I would argue that there are many reasons. Again, we can look at the individual factor, the higher levels of frailty, the immunocompromised uh, status, uh, atypical presentations of illness, but then we really need to think about the whole uh, the layers around those people as well, the close quarters, the staff who may or may not be uh, immunized themselves or may come from marginalized communities living in community clusters. So again, um, it, I'd encourage us to think uh, in the big picture, but the individual immune responses and vulnerability, but also out to the other layers that we could apply to try to protect people. We usually think of infections uh, and their outcomes in the short term, as I mentioned. We need to think longer term. This is a summary of some of the results we've seen in our network. So say we take 100 older people admitted to hospital with influenza or an acute respiratory illness. Um, about 12 of them will unfortunately die during the admission. 68 of them will leave hospital at approximately the same functional level that they came in at. But unfortunately, these 20 people have had a measurable and very significant functional decline. For some of those, it's moderate. They may, may need help in one additional activity of daily living, for example, or in some higher order functional uh, activities. But for these um, 11 people, they've suffered catastrophic functional decline, which persists beyond the hospital discharge. And indeed, three of them will need to go to nursing home when they didn't come in from a nursing home. So this really needs to turn our attention to these longer term functional outcomes. So hopefully we've had a chance to see what frailty has to do with vaccines and infections. It has a lot to do with understanding vaccine effectiveness and outcomes. And it's critical to understanding the true burden uh, for older people's outcomes. So what do we do to apply this all to vaccinology? How can we avoid frailty? I, I found this quite fascinating when the COVID-19 vaccine uh, rollout was happening. The first people to get the vaccine were 90 year old uh, residents of long term care facilities, which is great high risk um, population for sure. How many 90 year old residents of long term care facilities do you think were in the COVID-19 trials? And the answer is zero. So um, we're fortunate that the, the vaccine seems to have worked quite well in this age group, but we do need more understanding of that. So what I would argue is that we really need the expertise of uh, people with a geriatric lens about age and frailty to be considered at every stage in vaccine development, evaluation um, and program implementation. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about this more, um, but really it's something that uh, needs to happen. So if we put it all together, how can we protect uh, our older populations, many of whom are frail? So I like to think of this as this sort of Swiss cheese critical incidence um, model, right? So the problem happens when the uh, holes in the Swiss cheese line up at every level. So certainly when we take the individual, if they're frail, they're gonna have bigger holes in their Swiss cheese. We need to help close those holes, make them smaller with vaccine protection. Um, and underlying care for their vulnerability and frailty. But we need to protect them upstream as well. We have to be able to identify their, their illness better if they present atypically, uh, treat, figure out better uh, pathways of treatment, uh, reduce the chances of being exposed, and uh, really present a wraparound uh, protection at the multiple levels of their social context. So that is just some thoughts about how we can try to improve uh, older people's quality of life by adding life to years. So, so here is somebody progressing through the stages of frailty on the clinical frailty scale uh, as they accumulate health insults over their lifetime. What we want to do is try to reverse that, turn it around and avoid frailty. And this is one example of a strategy that aims to do that by the Canadian Frailty Network, uh, where these five things are um, advocated for, including V for vaccinate. So thank you so much for your interest, and I'll be happy to participate in the discussion afterwards. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. I, I promised you all that we would be able to communicate this in an effective way, and I think you did a great job. Uh, but I won't ask any questions now. I'm going to try and ask them all at the end. Uh, so I'll introduce our next speaker, who's Dr. Antonio Torres. Dr. Torres is a professor in medicine at the University of Barcelona and head of the Respiratory Intensive Care Unit at the hospital clinic. Um, he uh, also leads a research group 
on applied research and respiratory diseases uh, at now, excuse my Spanish or Catalan, but the Institut d'Investigation Biomédique Auguste P. Sunier, um, from where he facilitates translational research outcomes. And he's co-authored over 300 papers. So we're really uh, talking about an expert in the field here. And Dr. Torres, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. It is my pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the organizer for inviting me to this webinar uh, on vaccination. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. And uh, you can see here the contents. I'll uh, review the burden of pneumococcal disease and pneumonia in adults with respiratory diseases, the efficacy of PCV13 in this population, and recommendations for vaccination. I will not cover for uh, the shake of time serotypes after vaccination either. Well, uh, this fits very well uh, with uh, what uh, Professor Andrew uh, said before in her presentation. Uh, you can see here the, the risk factors for uh, uh, pneumococcal disease. Uh, and you can see that age uh, older than 65 is uh, one of the main factors of that. But there are other risk factors, the comorbidities. And today I'm going to review for you uh, the risk factors, uh, the risk of uh, patients with chronic lung disease as, as regards pneumococcal, pneumococcal disease. Uh, you can see here patients at high risk that include the, the immunosuppressive patients and the HIV infection, but there are also as well environmental factors very important, a preceding viral respiratory infection, infection for example, influenza, uh, resident in an institution, and uh, three or four behavioral factors such as the, the most frequent ones are smoking and alcohol abuse. Well, in this slide, you can see, and this is data from the United States that uh, uh, um, patients age uh, more than 65 years, 46% uh, of them have at least uh, one uh, comorbidity and they are included in the category of at risk, one or more chronic condition. And this is very important because this, uh, uh, so here the combination of uh, age plus comorbidities is, is it increases the risk of uh, having pneumococcal pneumonia and any infection. In this slide, you can see the higher burden of invasive pneumococcal uh, disease in adults with chronic pulmonary disease. This was published in 2012. Uh, this is the incidence per 100,000 inhabitants per year. Uh, and this is the case fatality ratio. You can see that in individuals older than 65, uh, the, the, when they have a chronic pulmonary disease, uh, there is an increase in the incidence of uh, invasive pneumococcal disease and an increase in mortality, a very important increase in mortality. So there is no doubt about that. In this slide, uh, a paper from uh, 2014 uh, is a retrospect cohort study that shows the incidence of IPD uh, as uh, comparing healthy individuals with uh, comorbidities, diabetes, chronic cardiovascular disease, smoking, chronic liver disease, alcoholism, asthma, and chronic pulmonary disease. And if you look at here, this population, the chronic pulmonary disease divided by age, you can see here that this combination, age and chronic pulmonary disease, increases a lot the incidence of IPD. Well, and the same for asthma. Uh, <clears throat> this is from uh, the same paper, is what happens, which is very frequent when these uh, patients have one, more than one comorbidity. And, lo and look at here, uh, divided again by age, that uh, uh, the combination of uh, 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 this comorbidity is stratified by age increases, for example, in the case of chronic lung disease, 7.7 fold the risk of the, uh, in that case, pneumococcal pneumonia. On the other hand, when uh, uh, patients have com a community acquired pneumonia, and the most frequent is pneumococcal pneumonia, uh, 
uh, you can see in this information that uh, uh, in, in some cities, uh, 40 to 50 or even to 60% have a chronic respiratory condition, mainly chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, when a, a patient with acquired pneumonia has a comorbidity, very frequently uh, these patients report a worsening or it is observed a worsening of uh, their condition. For example, in asthma, 22%, 24% in COPD, 9% uh, in, in chronic emphysema that probably should be included here, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, etc. When patients have uh, a community acquired pneumonia and uh, they have concomitantly a COPD, they have nine more likely uh, times uh, or risk to be hospitalized and uh, the mortality increases a lot. For example, 50% higher, 30 day mortality rates compared to uh, other population without COPD. And what about the smoking? smoking is not really a comorbidity, but it is a risk factor for pneumococcal pneumonia for invasive pneumococcal disease. It is very well demonstrated. These two papers from Nuorti and from Almirail uh, show the odds ratio for having a, a pneumococcal pneumonia uh, in relation to the current smoker and the number of cigarettes per day or the packs per year. Uh, and, uh, in this paper that we published in 2015, and uh, we review uh, the cohort studies and the case control studies uh, that uh, studied uh, smoking as a risk factor, uh, you can see that in, in both there is an increased risk uh, for pneumococcal pneumonia and that uh, for invasive pneumococcal disease. And uh, so a smoking habit is, is, a, is a very clear result for that. And uh, one question is about uh, if these patients uh, have to be vaccinated or to be included in the programs of pneumococcal vaccine. Well, let's see the efficacy of the conjugated vaccines. We know that the conjugated vaccine are uh, superior in terms of immunogenicity compared to the polysaccharide vaccines. Now, the, the two most important one that we have is the PCV13, the conjugated, uh, and the polysaccharide PPV23. In, in this study, uh, they look at the response, uh, the immunogenetic immunogenicity response after vaccination with PCB13 or uh, PPB23. And you can see that the PCB13, most of the serotypes uh, increased the immunogenicity response uh, when compared to PPB23. This is the first point. Second is this post hoc analysis. This is a pool analysis of studies uh, determining the functional antibody response one month after vaccination in this population, 60 to 64. And uh, this is the, the patient profile. Uh, and you can see here the patients that receive one or uh, the other vaccine. And uh, you can see here the other cohort of 50 to 59 years. Well, uh, this is important. You can see the immunogenicity response measured by OPA uh, geometric means. Uh, stratified by age and stratified by a risk. Uh, this is diabetes mellitus, chronic pulmonary disease, chronic cardiovascular disease. And you can see here that the administration of the uh, PCB13, uh, most of the uh, OPAS increased for the majority of serotypes. In some of them, uh, the response was higher in some of them was lower, but overall there was a, a good response. This is another study about the PCB13 efficacy by a stratification of particip participants in the big study capital trial, the only randomized uh, control trial in, in, with, in pneumococcal, with pneumococcal, using pneumococcal vaccines in adults uh, 65 years or older. Well, they divided the patients and at risk 
and without known risk. And very importantly, at risk meant uh, these conditions, heart disease, lung disease, asthma, diabetes, with or without insulin use, liver disease, smoking, and history of spleen removal. And these were the groups. And these were the results. This is the vaccine effectiveness. This is specific 13, as this is placebo for the entire population, and then for risk. Vaccine efficacy or vaccine effectiveness uh, was 45% in the entire population, but in patients at risk, so those patients that had comorbidities, uh, the, the vaccine efficacy was acceptable, uh, was 40. Uh, and in contrast, of course, as expected in, in patients uh, without non-risk was almost 67. This is the same, I can skip this one. And what happened in the real world uh, studies? This is a, a study published by Mark Lodley in Clinical Infectious Disease, is a case control study using a test negative design in uh, American adults, uh, 65 years of older, nested in a large population based on CAP surveillance study. This study was uh, performed in the majority of hospitals uh, in, in Louisville and Kentucky. Uh, patients uh, were 65 or older. They have a confirmed CAP, uh, defined at least by the clinical criteria for pneumonia because the capita, uh, the pneumonia was just reported by the patients of the administrative data. Uh, the age was, uh, I commented before, and they provided consent to have pneumococcal vaccination history confirmed by health insurance uh, records. Uh, these were the exclusion criteria. They look at the urine samples to determine uh, the serotypes uh, uh, included in the PCB13. And this is the population, and this confirms what I said before, 52% of the patients had COPD and others had other comorbidities. The overall hospital mortality of that population hospitalized was 6.5 and the 30 day all cause mortality almost 13%. And you can see here the, vac the vaccine results, this is the vaccine efficacy in the crude model was uh, uh, 72 for all PCB13 type cap and 70 for non-bacteremic PCB13 type cap. And when they were adjusted by several confounders, uh, the results were, were really good because the efficacy was 71 and, and 67. Uh, this is a small study that uh, it was a it was a non-randomized was an observational study performed in Spain, and uh, they investigated 121 patients with COPD, uh, and this study deals with uh, if the vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine, uh, can is doing anything in the rate of exacerbations. They divided the population in 24 percent frequent exacerbators and 76 non-exacerbations. And you can see here the percentages of uh, patients vaccinated with uh, PCV13 uh, in this population, and these are the results. So in the frequent exacerbators, that means uh, two or more exacerbations in the last year, uh, you can see that the rate, uh, the proportion of hospital admission, admissions was uh, decrease in the vaccinated population. But this is just an observational study. Uh, we cannot say uh, that uh, vaccination decreases the number of exacerbations of that population. And what about the recommendations? The Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, the GOLD uh, recommendations, uh, they uh, generically recommend for influenza in COPD, for uh, pneumococcal vaccination uh, in patients uh, 65 years of older, and then uh, they recommended the polysaracate vaccine uh, in younger COPD patients with significant comorbid conditions, including chronic heart or lung disease. But this is very generic. Uh, 
And these are the ASIC recommendations. Uh, and in Spain, we have a similar recommendations. For immunocompetent or what is considered immunocompetent patients, okay, uh, the PCB13 is generically recommended for those patients aged 19 or older. And between 19 and, and, and 64, the, the polysaccharide vaccine for persons one dose and uh, uh, a booster after five years. And then for those uh, with uh, 65 years of all or, or older, uh, there is a, the, the recommendation is a, a, a based uh, shared clinical decision uh, with the patient. And I, I can see here your the details that uh, say that uh, with increased age, uh, the risk of pneumonia is higher in patients among uh, those uh, individuals with chronic heart, lung or liver disease, diabetes or alcoholism, and those who smoke cigarettes and who have more than one chronic medical conditions. And then uh, providers practice caring for these patients uh, may consider offering PCV13 to such patients who are aged 65 years older who have not previously received PCV13. So it's a shared decision. I have to say that this recommendation in, in Spain is not uh, refunded, and this is an important problem. Well, these are the Spanish recommendations for vaccination. I'm, I'm not going uh, to go through these because they are very similar. And uh, my conclusions, uh, the burden of pneumococcal disease is high in patients with chronic respiratory disease, and particularly in the older population, that a smoking is a very important risk factor for pneumococcal disease, and uh, there should be recommendations about that uh, a regard pneumococcal vaccination, for sure. And we know now that the immunogenicity and effectivity of PCB13 in older adults and patients with chronic respiratory conditions is is well demonstrated. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Torres. Uh, I have so many questions, but I'm going to restrain myself because I hope our third speaker has arrived. I can see his name there, but I can't see him. So I'm going to introduce you, Martin. I hope you, you, you're you there behind the name. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Martin Fried. Ah, he's there, everybody. So Martin is the coordinator of the Initiative for Vaccine Research at the World Health Organization here in Switzerland. He's really one of the world's experts on vaccine research, but I'm not going to go into all of that. I'm just going to tell you one little story. When, when I started as the Director of Aging at the World Health Organization almost 15 years ago, in my first week in my post, somebody called me up who I'd never heard of and said, do you want to go and have lunch? And it ended up being Martin Freed. And he said at lunch, have you ever heard of immune senescence and inflammation? And it's been a passion of mine ever since. And Martin, I'm sure you're going to bring the rest of the audience into this passion. And then when you finish, we're going to have, a, I'm sure, a very uh, uh, exciting discussion. So over to you. OK, thanks. Thanks, John. I'm going to share my screen. Um, ba -ba -bum. Let me make sure we've got the right one. Otherwise, it could be embarrassing. Um, OK, do you see my screen? Just confirmation. OK. Let's try and get slideshow. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, let's go back up. I'm going to talk about immune senescence, uh, the impact of immune senescence, what causes it. And of course, we'd love to avoid it, but come, please don't hold your breath waiting for me to tell you how to avoid immune senescence other than dying early, which is an unfortunate way to do it. Right, so <clears throat> I think we've already covered this in the previous talk, but we, aging is associated with increased risk of infection and decreased efficacy of vaccination. And here what we can see on the left-hand side, of course, of the topic that everybody's talking about is the COVID vaccine effectiveness and weeks after vaccination. So here we can see that in the, the two red lines, that's 80, 80 years and above and 70 to 79 years, the vaccine was effective, okay? We, we saw an, a decrease in the incidence of, of, of infection.
infection um, as soon as this population received the vaccine. But about 38 weeks after receiving the vaccine, you can see that in these two groups, 70 to 80 plus, the effectiveness is dropping off and it's dropping off rapidly. And we're beginning to see these people once again being infected. Whereas the younger population, uh, my age, 60 to 69, we are still holding out, but maybe it's beginning to pick up. So the older populations, you've got a shorter duration of, of immunity. And we see, we've known this for a long time. For example, this graph in the middle, this is antibody titus to tetanus by how many years since you last got your tetanus shot. And unfortunately, in a lot of countries, you, you get tetanus while you're young and at school, but once you've left the school system, you don't get your tetanus booster anymore. And here we can see that while young people if they've had the last shot 11 to 15 years ago, they've still got pretty good antibody titers. In older people, uh, that's the red bars, it's, it's dropped off really below, it's, it's down to zero almost. So again, we've, we've known this for some time. And on the right, something which we just discussed is the increased incidence of pneumonia. We talk about, we vaccinate young children, but the real burden of pneumonia is in old people. So, why does this happen? So we're now going to get into the causes of immune senescence, and there are multiple causes, but I'm going to talk about what we think is one of the main drivers, which is the, the thymus gland. So this is where our T cells are made. For those who don't know where the thymus is there, it's sitting just behind your sternum. It's relatively small. And all mammals have got these. On the right-hand side, you've got a thymus from a cow. And um, just below that, you've got the thymus from the cow prepared with some nice herbs and spices, because apparently it's quite delicious to eat. I've never eaten it. Now, this is T cells. Thymus is where our T cells are made. But also importantly, this is where T cells learn to differentiate self from non-self, which is very important. Now, unfortunately, you can see here this, this graph of uh, as we grow older. So here we've got the age 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And around about age 40, your medulla, the medulla in the, in the, in the thymus has completely disappeared. The cortex has reduced significantly, and this has been replaced simply by fat. So this is what we call thymic involution. It is progressive reduction in size due to the depletion of the thymic cortex and medulla. And you can see on the electromicrographs below what this looks like. When you're young, you've got this beautifully formed cortex medulla there. And it is in this infrastructure of the cortex and medulla that your T cells are being made and they're learning what is you and what is not you. In other words, what to attack and what not to attack. And by the time you get to, to my age, unfortunately, your thymus uh, looks a bit like that's what's, what's on the right there. There's not much cortex or medulla left there to generate new T lymphocytes or to train them. Now, this involution has got major consequences on the immune system. So the first and most important is the reduced thymopoiesis. This is reduced output of naive T cells. And this reduced output of naive T cells leads to peripheral clonal T cell expansion and essentially your inability to respond to new vaccines when you get to, to new infections, to new immune exposure when you get older. Now, I, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here and say essentially it, you, when, you, time, when your time is involuted, it's a bit like when you take retirement. The money you've got in your bank account, you've got to live with that for the rest of your life. So when you hit 50, the, T, the naive T cells that you've got in your bloodstream, you've got to live with those for the rest of your life. If you're going to chew them up too quickly, well, you're going to get to the point of being immunologically broke quicker. Now, there's other things that happen as well. In the thymus, you've got, we also have an imbalanced Treg generation. So we, this means that we are less able to reduce autoimmune. This, this means our autoimmune suppression is going to be reduced. In other words, we can have autoimmune events taking place more readily. And we've also got impaired negative selection, which means you're going to have an increase in self-reactive T cells. These, these two are, are, are linked to one another. But this means that we're going to be getting increased tissue damage and inflammation. This is what we call inflammaging. And this inflammation, which is the inflammatory process that arrives with age, is associated with an increase in IL-6. You get a constitutive IL-6 production. And this is kind of like noise. So if somebody's talking to you in a discotheque, 
um, you, you can't really hear what they're saying. And if they're saying to you, warning, warning, there's a pathogen arriving, you might be saying, what, what, what did you say? And this is what's happening when you've got inflammation. You've got this, this major background immunological noise. And so in the event of an infection or even the event of a vaccine, the body just isn't getting that signal fast enough. So this timing involution results in a decreased ability to respond to new, new immunological events and even a decrease in my ability to respond to some old events. Now, in summary, this is what happens to your T-cell repertoire throughout life. And I'm sorry, I, I can't even see my own screen. Okay, that's better. So this is the change in the T-cell repertoire throughout your life. When you are young, you've got essentially, when you're born, you've just got naive T-cells. And quite quickly, exposed to vaccines and infections, you're going to start making memory T-cells. But by the time you get to being a young adult, you've still got lots of naive T-cells. You're making these things every day. You've got memory T-cells, but you've begun to accumulate effect T-cells. Unfortunately, when you get older, when you've got well past 50, your thymus is not generating any more naive T-cells you've been chewing these T cells up for the last 10 or 20 or 30 years. All that's left are memory T cells and effector T cells. So number one, your ability to respond to something new is significantly reduced. Now, this happens all across life. Here we can see what the T cell decline across all adult life. Now, here on the left graph, we can see naive T cells. This, these are all T cells, but importantly, they are naive. They have not yet seen something. And so even by the age of 30, 30 to 50, we've dropped down compared to our 6 to 25. And by the time we get to 85, uh, 85 and above, we've dropped down significantly. That is all T cells. But when we look at specifically at the CD8s, this is what we're looking at uh, over on, on the, on the right-hand graph, we're comparing the CD4s and the CD8s. When we look at the age 50 to 75 or 75 to 103, there are almost no naive CD8s left at all. Now, this is really important. This means our ability to respond to, to a, a viral infection. We've got no naive CD8s. If we're lucky, there's a memory CD8. But if there's no naive CD8, we could be in real difficulty. So this has led us to the, some observations that have been seen. And since the total T cell number remains relatively constant, this change is that we see, it's, it's we enable to identify what we call an immune risk profile or IRP. This is first and foremost where the total number of CD8s exceeds the total number of CD4s because we've been accumulating these, these effector CD8s, memory CD8s. And where in these CD8s have got a very low CD8, uh, there's a very low proportion of naive CD8s. So this means you've got a high effect to memory, memory ratio, which if you really want to get into details, this is CD45RA to CD25 ratio. So this is what we call the immune risk profile. Now, not all old people at the same age are going to have the same immune profile. So the memory effect to CD8 ratio varies in elderly persons, and this impacts the response to vaccines. So here we can see a young person, elderly type 1, which we just classified as type 1, elderly type 2. And what we can really see here is, uh, okay, that's better. Here, what we can really see is that in this elderly type 2, where we've got a huge ratio, the effector, the effector T cells, which you can see there, um, the ratio of these to the memory T cells is very, very high. Okay, and it is in the elderly type two that we, we each of these groups received an influenza vaccine. You can see the young people; they got a good response. The elderly type one also got a response. Okay, but it's the elderly type two that didn't didn't respond to the flu vaccine, and it is this elderly type two we are going to say this is immunosuppressed. They, these are in, in, in immune senescence. Their immune system has gone into senescence. It is not responding to immune stimuli. And unfortunately, this is not linked to your chronological age. So some people, and we'll, 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 let's get into this now. So this loss of equilibrium. Okay, this this. Um, rate of, of, of removal of our naive CD8 cells. Now, 
as I said, you, you get to retirement, you've got a certain amount of money in your bank account. Well, if you live frugally, that's going to last a long time. But of course, if you go, if you go to the, 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 the casino every night and, 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 and live a, 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 a high lifestyle, you're going to chew up the money more quickly. Well, what is the immune equivalent? The immune equivalent is having chronic infections, which your immune system has to be handling every day. So for example, one such chronic infection is cytomegalovirus. Now, by the time you get to, to my age, it is extremely likely that you've actually got cytomegalovirus. And here we can see on the left, the age distribution of CMV seropositivity. This comes from the US and women. But actually, those different graphs represent different socioeconomic strata. That the lower the socioeconomic strata, the earlier the age of onset of CMV, and the wealthier you were, the, the later you got, you got CMV. Now, this is quite important because what we then, what we, sorry, others did, and um, I, I, I will share the slides later because the, I can't see the name of the author of this paper, which I'm referring to here, it's, but it is on the slide. Um, different populations were, were, were examined to say, do they have CD8 against cytomegalovirus? And of course, in young people, there's not many, not many of them have CD8 to cytomegalovirus. Middle age, they were. But in the old, of course, there was, most old people had um, CD8 to CMV. But when they looked specifically in the old people that had a, a what we call this immune risk profile where the CD8 exceeded the CD4s, we see the, here that we've got a huge percentage of, of, of these um, anti, anti CMV um, CD8s. And this was interesting to say, well, is it the, is it the fact that as these people, as their CD8s are being used up every day, keeping the CMV under control, is this resulting in an increased rate of consumption of the naive CD8s, increased rate of, of, of arrival of our CD8 effector cells? And so essentially heading into this immune risk profile. Well, it was then really interesting. This was a this was the, the, the first one I can't remember. You'll get it in the, in the slide, copies of the slides. But this was Graham Powerlek's work at University of Tübingen. He then looked into these CMV seropositive people. These these were all non Nigerians with the immune risk profile, and realized that they had a significantly lower number of clones. So CD8 clones. How many? What is the clonal diversity? compared to people that were non-immune risk profile. And really scary now was that the decrease in clone numbers was associated with the shorter survival time. So Graham Powerlek ran a longitudinal clinical study for years, looking at the survival time of, of diff people with different immunological profiles. And clearly, if you had few uh, a few clones, and you were CMV positive and had an IRP profile, well, then, unfortunately, your survival time was very short in terms of months. But if you had more clones, your survival time was longer. This is a kind of scary graph, because when you look at that, your R squared is not far off from one. Simplified explanation, continual fighting off of CMV eats up naive cells until all that is left is anti-CMV effector cells. So <clears throat> does the immune system age comparably across different populations? To be honest, we don't really know. We, we, we've seen now that, that CMV is one factor. We think that other infections, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes simplex virus, HIV, of course, schistosomiasis, but maybe other things. These are also able to, to, to chew into your immune savings uh, once you get past 50. And it, it, we could be, take different groups of populations of exactly the same chronological age and they go to have completely different immunological ages. This is because of their exposure to chronic infections, yes. But what about other factors such as diet, stress factors? We don't actually know. We tried to do a study some years ago to look at biomarkers to help identify this, at least certainly better than a simple CD8 to CD4 ratio. And we tried to do this with, with a biomarker called the, the T cell receptor excision circles, which will increase in number each time your T cell ticks over. 
And while it should work, it's quite a, it's quite a technically heavy um, assessment to be done and couldn't, unfortunately couldn't be done on the dried blood samples that we had accumulated from around the world in populations over the age of 50. But this is a, an interesting area of research. We believe, but we don't have a lot of evidence, that the immune, the immune age is for, a, let's say, a 65-year-old rural Indian uh, is probably going to have an older immune age than a 65-year-old um, urban Tokyoite or something like that. So the environment is going to have a huge impact on your real immune age. And that is because of impact on the weight, the way in which you're chewing up your, your T cells, but also possibly the health of your, of your thymus and other organs. So this, of course, is what you all came to listen to, is, is, is can we prevent or avoid immune senescence? And this tells you how to do it. So there is apparently somewhere on earth a fountain of youth. Uh, the, art, the artist here, Edward Weith, who unfortunately died in 1925, um, knew where it was. Um, and there you can see him painting some old man going to drink from this fountain of youth. But for the moment, unfortunately, I would say that we do not know how to prevent your thymic involution. And if we can't prevent thymic involution, what you have to remember is that once it's involuted, you're not making many new T cells every day. So you have to avoid getting infections to the best you can. So my conclusions or food for thought, chronological age is not indicative of immunological age. Many factors can accelerate or delay immune senescence, but these are poorly understood. Chronic infections, possibly nutrition, and of course, genetics. The impact of vaccines in the immune senescence is reduced, but so is their, 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 also they become more susceptible to infection. So even with a reduced a vaccine effectiveness, it is worthwhile vaccinating older people. And we need to be working on things like adjuvants and other immune simulators to try and make these vaccines work better in this population. And we've got such vaccines for influenza where we add adjuvants to enhance the immune uh, effect. We don't have good diagnostic tools. So this whole field of immune senescence needs better diagnostic tools. And we need to be doing some population-wide screening. And uh, my final thought is, if you can avoid catching cytomegalovirus, but I suspect for many of us on this call, we've probably already got it. So John, I'll stop there and go back to you. Thank you for the grim news, uh, Martin. Uh, and thank you all speakers. And I think we have sort of a theme that is running through all the talks, whether it be at a cellular immune level, whether it be in terms of pulmonary function or in terms of frailty. And that is that much more accurate in terms of assessing your vulnerability to infection and also probably vaccine effectiveness is uh, some estimate of your health status, whether it be CD8, CD4 counts, whether it be pulmonary function, whether it be a, a frailty index, or as I would think of it, a, a, a intrinsic capacity measure. Um, now, it seems, it seems to me, though, that we're presented with a dilemma, because I chaired a, a meeting a few weeks ago, and I remember very clearly uh, a speaker from the United States, where they actually, in terms of vaccination schedules, have a very good vaccination schedule, which covers young, middle age and old with very clear ages when people should be getting back vaccinated. Um, she said that it's much easier to actually have a schedule if it's based on chronological age. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the speakers think in terms of, I, I understand and totally agree that we can't sort of, uh, put every person over a certain chronological age in the same box and expect the same response. But in terms of vaccination and vaccination schedules, maybe that's the first step that we actually have to take. So uh, uh, if we just go through in order of people presenting, Dr. Andrews, do, do, do you have a, a response to that? Yes, I um, think that's very sensible because there is this tension between having ever more accurate um, either clinical or biomarker measures um, but the feasibility of implementing those, particularly in settings that don't have the, uh, the same access to resources. Um, so uh, although we, we definitely need to keep driving to understand better measures to grade vulnerability, um, using something that's um, non-arbitrary, easy to collect, um, and um, easy to implement is very sensible, and age uh, does meet those criteria. Um, but I think as we heard um, from Dr. Freed, like even 
age as as crude as it is, you could uh, have different age cutoffs in different risk populations. So for example, in indigenous communities in Canada, we know, uh, and in some other communities too, that, that frailty or, or vulnerability happens potentially at younger ages. And so just like you said, in the, the people who are living in say rural India versus in Tokyo, so maybe you'd have a different age cutoff at a younger age to start um, having the benefits of these programs for communities that are particularly identified at risk, but using age is, is quite a sensible measure uh, to start with. Professor Torres? Well, <clears throat> I think the same. Age is very easy, and uh, uh, but probably we should go farther, not only age, because uh, as, as shown by, by Dr. Frieden, uh, the the immunological response or the senescence is not the same for all individuals after 65 or 65 or older. We should have, uh, uh, for example, biomarkers that would uh, stratify the population or, and comorbidities. Comorbidities are very important. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and alcohol and smoking as well. This is very important as well. I think that we should use comorbidities, toxic habits, age as the first step. And then if we could measure immunosenescence uh, in some way, this could be uh, very important. What free? Okay, what so free? I mean, <laughs> it's going to be almost impossible to, to, to have a policy where you say, well, you know, get, come and get your vaccine when your, when your T-REC uh, number has exceeded uh, 236. That won't work. So we, you know, the only thing we've got that people can will be able to respond to is age. But I think, as the others have mentioned, that we've got age in different subpopulations. So first of all, let's look at the age between countries. Let's not get and say, around the world, we're going to give this vaccine at 65. It could be that in some countries, the ideal age is 60 because the populations might not get to 65 very much. And other populations, it might be later, it might be 70. So let's get national policy based on what their national observations are. Let's get more research. I think we just don't understand this at all uh, very much. I think we, some of us were very surprised at how effective the Zoster vaccine was, although that's a boost, it's not really priming. Um, but I don't think we can do much other than age, but it would be good that we're able to Degranulate granulate it a bit and say, well, in this population, if you've got, if you're obese, take five years off. If you've got diabetes, take another five years off, et cetera. So, okay, so, so, so Martin, you, you mentioned Zoster and it does seem like the exception that proves the rule because there's this incredibly high vaccine effectiveness. But also earlier in, in your talk, you mentioned the vaccine effectiveness of the COVID vaccines uh, for older people. Um, I'm I'm wondering why, why, why was it's COVID as opposed to influenza vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine? Why is it almost as effective in older people as it is in younger people when they don't have uh, naive T cells? Okay, so um, we when we do these studies, we're doing them on fairly broad, broad populations. So you, I don't think. It's rare that you have no naive T cells. So they've got some naive T cells, but what we're seeing is that that immunity doesn't last long. So we're getting a response. It is it is decaying, and it's not only due to antibodies. So we've got a decay. So this first of all is antibodies, which don't don't really require the CD8 response. So I, what I didn't go into was bone marrow, and with sarcopenia, loss of bone marrow. With loss of bone marrow, we've got decreased B lymphocyte generation. That's the other side of the story, but that would have taken too long to get into. So. Let's come back. Zoster, it's a booster. So with Zoster, we've got the memory cells there. We've, we just require the booster. So the Zoster booster from the GSK vaccine that appears to work pretty effectively. COVID, surprising how effective it was, especially given how susceptible the old population was to COVID, but not surprising how rapidly that immunity is dying off. And it could be that the reason it's not dying off in younger is that because their T cell memory to the vaccine is what's keeping them above, uh, their heads above water. Whereas in, in elderly, it's, it's the B cell memory that's dying off. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned sarcopenia, which brings us back to Dr. Andrew's uh, talk at the beginning, and frailty, sarcopenia, and frailty often coexist. Um, and I'm wondering if the issue of, of less bone marrow in patients who are frail might explain some of the things that you, you were reporting in, in your talk. That's an excellent question. Um, 
And I think uh, we're just sort of on the cutting edge still of under trying to understand this. So there are studies that are looking into immune responses, immune profiles in relation to frailty, which is again, something that you can at least measure clinically without doing a, a blood spectrometry, <laughs> um, which isn't, um, uh, feasible on a widespread scale. Um, so that, that question about sarcopenia and bone marrow is a really great one. I don't know the answer and I, I hope that the field keeps going to figure it out. Dr. Tor Fine. Yeah. Dr. Torres, um, did you have anything to add? I think that there is not a clear answer for that, for your question. Okay, I'd, I'd like to then shift to research. Well, what I wanna talk about in a minute and try to remind me if I forget is why vaccination in older age has been such a low priority when there seems to be such fertile ground. Um, but um, first I, I want to talk about clinical trials because historically clinical trials have tended to exclude older people and where they, or, or people with comorbidities and where they do include them, they don't necessarily take account of the heterogeneity which we've been talking about in terms of other measures of people's vulnerability. Um, happily, when it came to COVID, um, a lot of the major trials actually included older people, although, as Martin said, it may not have, have, have captured all the subtle variation in, in amongst older people. Um, do you think that having the experience now of COVID and seeing that you can do trials with a number of older people, although these were very, very large trials, which makes it easier, as we move forward, are we going to be able to continue doing that or are we going to fall back on... Uh, trials which exclude the people who probably are most at need of the of the intervention we're looking at. Um, Dr. Andrew, any comments? Yeah, um, I think that's a critical point. Um, and hopefully we do learn from our experience with COVID. Now, the COVID trials have been, maybe were somewhat better than previous trials, but still, you know, didn't include the frailest people, you know, and they do tend to be harder to include. And so we need strategies all along the way to include them. And so this is where I was uh, mentioning that point about like involving people who know about and care about older adults um, and the particular ways to measure vulnerability um, is really important at all stages of vaccine development, like right from deciding which adjuvants or which technology perhaps to use through to who to include in the trials, which case definitions to use, because if they're too restrictive, we miss a lot of atypical presentations in older people. Um, having trust in places like long-term care facilities where enrollment can be facilitated by someone on the ground who you know, has relationships, you know, not excluding people who have some degree of cognitive impairment if they're able to otherwise give consent. Um, and all the way through to having people who care about this um, involved in the, uh, the regulatory um, uh, decision making and in designing and, in, and implementing um, vaccine program rollout because you need to have the sites accessible, for example, to people who have mobility limitations and uh, other um, frailty type conditions. So uh, I think it's exactly the point that it needs to happen all along the entire spectrum. Dr. Torres, uh, any yes, I trials? think this uh, your, your your question is a, is a critical point. I think that we have to move forward and to um, do trials that include this population at, at least with comorbidities. I don't know with the immunosuppression. This is another uh, or, or or these trials can be in the, in, in observational form the, when when we deal with. Uh, uh, immunosuppressed patients. I regard uh, pneumococcal vaccination with the PCV13, the capita included patients with comorbidity, older population with or without comorbidities. And for that reason, uh, we were able to see the, the vaccine effectiveness in, in the population with a, at least where risk, which is very frequent. Martin? Okay, well, John, this is something you and I spent a lot of time discussing when, when we were working together. Um, you know, we, we've really got to do something more about this because as you've said, the, the entire immune R&D program has been based on the pediatric and then on the teenage and ad early adult life. And the elderly have been really ignored other than influenza, where quite honestly, the vaccines we've got are not great. 
and um, Zoster came along, we're now trying to get pneumococcal vaccines for them. But there are a whole host of diseases which are of significant importance to this population. And they've been very much neglected. So I can't tell you why they've been neglected. Um, economic, I don't think so, because we talk about the silver economy of providing health care to this population. Uh, so it, it, it really is time that we, we try and promote for, for research on this. As, as Dr. Torres pointed out, you know, one of the challenges, if we go into this population, almost everybody's got a comorbidity uh, of one form or another. And we're going to have to just work out how do we do studies where we can actually decipher afterwards which of these comorbidities had a negative impact and look at the real world situation. So I think anything we can do to be promoting this would be good. Excellent. Uh, All right, now, oh, sorry, Dr. Torres. Yes, no, just a question. Uh, uh, Dr. Frida said, uh, I don't know why this population was neglected because there's, there is an, an extra point that I, I, I want to mention is the general feeling about older age or older population. You understand what I mean? Comparing our, um, my generation with uh, a, a previous generations, uh, the care of the elderly uh, was impressive in the past. The social care, the, the, the family care, et cetera, et cetera. With this individualized society that we have now, uh, and then it, this is transmitted to every field of the the, the medicine and, and everything. Do, do you understand what I mean? No. Uh, absolutely, you're talking about the pervasive reach of ageism. I think, and uh, I would love to delve into it. We're going to be a bit tight on time um, now. I, what I was going to say is if there are any questions from the audience, please pose them. We've had a couple so far. I've tried to incorporate one into one of my questions. Um, uh, but I have a couple of others I'd like to, to follow through with a the theme of, of, of the discussion. But please, if anyone's in the audience you want to uh, ask a question, please put it in the, the chat uh, box. Um, OK, I'd like to put a, 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 another hypothesis about why um, we tend to have neglected these conditions in older age. And it comes back again to something Dr. Andrew said in the, in the first talk, that we do not tend to focus on functional outcomes. Um, with children, we look at whether people get, a, person, a child gets measles or they don't get measles, or they die from measles or they don't die from measles. We actually don't look at the long-term impact it has on their functioning. We don't look at the long-term impact it may have on, on their, on their uh, immune functioning across life. Um, and certainly in older age, we very rarely think about the functional consequences as an outcome that's measured. And so, for example, you know, you, you mentioned Zoster, Martin, and Zoster is such a fantastic vaccine, and yet it's not really widely taken up. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is that people don't understand the severe consequences of getting Zoster in older age, because you don't die. Um, but you may actually have chronic pain, which can lead to increased risk of institutionalization and so on and so forth. And I think if we start looking at some of those more functional outcomes, per perhaps we might start getting more awareness of the impact of infectious diseases and start thinking about, well, maybe we need to, to vaccinate a little bit earlier and be thinking about these things a little bit differently. So, um, Martin, do, uh, do you have a response to that? Um, yes, yes. Um, hmm. No, ask somebody else first. Okay, Dr. Andrew. Well, I tried to feed off what you said in your in your presentation, but th does that resonate? Uh, certainly does. Um, we need to be advocating for more uh, inclusion of relevant health measures and outcomes for older people in all kinds of studies. So um, many older people that I talk to would value their function and independence even more than you know they value whether or not they die from an infection. They'd rather pass away than live. Um, dependent on other people. And so we need to incorporate that, that sort of mindset and thinking into our studies from clinical trials uh, to surveillance studies, observational studies, and uh, big data. Um, it, the trick is to um, use measures when they're already collected, figure out ways to do that or, or incorporate them without adding too much to the burden on participants um, and to the cost of running the studies. Professor Torres? I, I think that uh, these outcomes have to be added to the studies. 
And uh, I, I would uh, uh, say in addition that, uh, for example, the, the severity of the disease of the infection is very important and the consequence of that infection, the short-term and the long-term consequences. For example, in pneumonia, we know very well that the, the, the patients die after this church from cardiovascular complications. And this risk uh, lasts at least for 10 years after this church in patients with pneumonia. Uh -huh. Okay, so let, let, let me come in now with, with, with some, maybe some other thoughts. So when we were discussing this previously, John, you and I were looking and saying, well, the world sees older people as having communic um, non-communicable diseases. It's the cardiovasculars, it's, it's things. So the, the world has said, well, look, let's focus on that. And they were saying, well, your mortality in old people is only 20% due to the infectious diseases. That was one of the reasons that we heard people aren't working on vaccines. So I hope that COVID has given a wake-up call to the community that actually infectious diseases are, are, are cataclysmic for the older population. And it's not just, as you've, you've said, you go to hospital with an infect with, 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 with flu or with COVID. When you come out, you might not be able to be independent. So you go from being independent to dependent. And that this can be avoided with vaccines. So I think we have to focus not just on mortality, because actually mortality when you're old, it's an unavoidable reality every single day. But it is this loss of independence. You know, and this is something that one, one of our colleagues, um, Janet McElhaney, has been working on a lot of influenza vaccines as or influenza as being one of the primary drivers of going from being an independent, living, living independently to becoming institutionalized. And this institutionalization costs a lot of money. So we've got to bring into our arguments the cost. What are the costs to society of these infectious diseases? And what are we, how are we reducing those costs by, by developing vaccines? And I think if we were to do this properly, we'd find there's a lot of disease targets for which it makes a lot of sense to be vaccinating older people. Maybe this idea that seems to have sort of become embedded in the broader community of long COVID as a consequence of COVID maybe we can be thinking about long influenza and long other things as well and thinking about those broader impacts. Of, uh, Professor Torres. Yeah, I, I, I have information that uh, we are going to publish in intensive care medicine about, and this is the discrepancy between mortality and, uh, and the consequence. Uh, we look at uh, more than 6,000 patients admitted to the intensive care unit. I presented the other day this information. And you know, the mortality at one year after discharge is 1% in our population. But 30% of them have a post-COVID disease. It's, uh, it's terrible, but uh, it really brings home the, the message. Um, now, Martin, I've got, a, I've got another question specifically for you because you, you spoke about cytomegalovirus and I'll just use it as an example. Of course, there might be other early life infections. But if we thought about things differently and we didn't accept immune senescence as it's currently experienced, could we be thinking, I know you said there's no fountain of youth, but could we be thinking about vaccines in early life against things like cytomegalovirus because of their subsequent impacts that they may have in older age, even though it may be 40 years later. Um, no. is, that, is that a crazy no. idea? Uh, no, it, it, it's not crazy. So the good news is that at least one company um, is developing an mRNA-based CMV vaccine. Now, CMV, for the moment, for the past many years, we've tried to make CMV vaccines, and we were not very successful. Hopefully, mRNA is now going to give us a, a, it's a tool that will enable us to get a handle on this. Now, the reason people make a CMV vaccine was, first and foremost, not for immune senescence. It is for people that are going to be going to transplantations. There are CMV can have um, fatal consequences for even without waiting for, for immune senescence. But the challenge we're going to have is if we were doing this to make it as a product, if the product's endpoint was delaying immune senescence, well, that clinical study will last 80 or 90 years. And <laughs> that's the challenge. But if the vaccine is there, then if we're doing reasonably good data or collection of data, then in 50 or 60 years time, we're going to start seeing the benefits of it. So that number one, I also do, do want to mention, I mean, I, I try to bring up diet. I think we have no 
good understanding at all about diet and other things, I don't know, vitamin Ds, vitamin As, et cetera. Um, what are the impact of these on, on delaying? Because the, the, the thymus doesn't actually die. It's there, but it's just ticking over more slowly. And you know, we don't have a good understanding about why some people get into 100 and are never sick. And other people, they barely make it past 60 in the same environment. It's not a question of, well, you're living in a dangerous country, you're not. not. So I think we've, there's more than just the thymus and, and years. And we don't have a good Is it physical activity. I have no idea. Um, if, you, if you if you believe so, the Queen of England, it's it's drinking gin that that does it. <laughs> well, okay. Now, physical Sorry. activity. Physical activity is is always good. Uh, in, in in all chronic diseases, it is demonstrated that the physical activity, for example, decreases the number of exacerbations in COPD patients, in bronchiectasis, etc. So probably has influence on in elderly. It may also help delay sarcopenia and the bone marrow consequences you were mentioned earlier, I think, Mark. So look, we're getting close to the, to the end of time. I've got uh, one question I think I haven't covered in the, in the chat. Um, is there an upward limit on the number of vaccines an, an older adult can or should have? And the person gives the example that they themselves have had six vaccines. I mean, is this going to have a negative impact on people's systems? No idea. Yeah. 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 Well, no, no, let, let, let me weigh in sort of, no, um, you, know, you get exposed to pathogens every single day, getting a vaccine yeah. and getting exposed to pathogens, no different. So no, no there is no limit. Okay. Excellent. Good news. Uh, Good news. <laughs> All right. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to uh, start to wind it up now. I'm, I'm going to give you just a flagging that I'm going to ask you each to sort of sum up where you think our discussion has led. If there's uh, something else you'd like to raise since we've had our discussion and uh, and then we'll sign off so again i'll go in order of speakers dr dr andrews uh, do you have some last words sure it's been a great discussion um so i think we've talked about the importance of uh, focusing on um, older people in relation to vaccination improving vaccination uptake and um, improving the products that we're developing for them thinking about relevant outcomes um, and really the long-term consequences. Those would be some really important things for me. Professor Torres. Oh, uh, well, this is a, a, a final thought, not this is the summary of the conference. So the, the governments, uh, the healthcare authorities and the industries should invest much more in research in, in elderly. And Martin, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question, Martin. How do we get this on the agenda for groups like Gavi, the, the global groups that that really drive the vaccination agenda? What is it that we need to do to get them to shift from this very narrow perspective focus they've had on childhood to start thinking more about the life course and these functional outcomes? Okay, so that, that's a difficult question. So Gavi has got almost as its mandate, it's a they're dealing with childhood vaccines, and they've got one or two which were aimed at teenagers or, or early adults. It's only with COVID that they've gone into vaccinating, and that was because of the, the country's lack of access to resources to acquire these vaccines. So I, I would say that we need to be driving the political will. And unfortunately, up until now, there's been very few people that have been actually hammering. And this is where, where groups like IFA can really get behind politicians and saying, you've got to be looking at this because it's not going to be getting this done through Gavi where they're going to be saying, well, how many dallies or qualies are we saving if we go into a, a six month old compared to a 69 year old? Um, our, our arguments would not resonate with them. I think we've got to drive the political will, which is that all people have a right to be getting access to vaccines that can prevent them getting infectious diseases so they remain functional. Our objective is not to extend life, but to extend the quality of life. Big point to end it all on. I'd like to thank you all for what I think has been a really exciting discussion. And now I'm going to pass back to IFA to just say a few more words and perhaps tell you about some of the following up uh, uh, parts of the webinar series. So thank you all for watching. Thank you so much, Dr. Beer, for moderating. And thank you to Dr. Andrew, Dr. Free, Dr. Torres for your very informative presentations. You know, um, I'd like to thank 
Ms. Anusha Khan, Project Officer with the IFA for her diligent work on this series, and Ms. Ashni Patrick, our Media Marketing Communications Officer for handling the tech and the communications. Um, so as we've mentioned, today is the first of a three-part webinar series on driving adult vaccination policy. And we hope to see everyone at the next webinar in the series. Uh, following this, following today, you will receive an invitation. And thank you so much from, from the IFA and I wish everyone a good rest of the day. Thank you.